Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming to this talk. Um, rather strange circumstances. I'm sure some of the other speakers have said it. I, I said it, I saw it on the talks that I've been to. Um, but glad that we can still do this. It's, uh, you know, on the upside, at least I can uh, go to a conference without leaving my own flat, which is nice. Um, on the downside, I don't get to see Oslo, which is a bit sad because I've never been to Oslo. Anyway, agile is a dirty word. Let's uh, move on with this. Oops, that's the wrong thing to press. Right, so who am I? I'm James. Um, I've been a consultant for five or six years now. Uh, I currently work for Cogerance, um, which is a consultancy based in London. Um, we're big in the, the software craft community around London and around the world. Before that, I worked for ThoughtWorks for a few years. And before that, I worked in a startup for 10 years. So I've, uh, I've done a few different things. And fun fact, which this is another good reason uh, why remote conferencing actually suits me. I suffer from face blindness. So the fact that I can't see anybody now just, uh, well, it doesn't really make any difference because normally when I'm at a conference, when there's a few hundred people in front of me, they, it just looks like a few hundred very similar blobs. So uh, this, this is not that different, except I can't see anybody face to face. So um, what am I gonna talk about today? Well, uh, agile is a dirty word. So first of all, what does this mean? How did agile become a dirty word? That slide's in the wrong position. I accidentally changed it earlier by the looks of it. So what are we gonna talk about today? How did agile become a dirty word? Uh, what exactly does that mean um, when agile is a dirty word? And then some techniques about improving the situation. If you find that agile is a dirty word, I'm going to go through some steps that um, we arrived at when I was at ThoughtWorks and later latterly at Cogerance to um, get organizations past the fact that, um, that agile is a dirty word. And then finally, what does it look like when, when things are clean? So uh, I have no idea how this will work over a uh, remote link like this. Um, but generally speaking, I like to do a pub quiz. This is a bit of a British thing. I don't know if it exists in Norway or other countries in Europe, but uh, we like them in the UK. So uh, a quick pub quiz. Um, normally, I would ask people to put their hands up in the audience. So I'm just going to have to pretend that people have done. So uh, the question is, does anybody know what country that is? Uh, well, that's Laos. This country is Algeria. This country is Congo, used to be called Zaire. This country is Timor-Leste, East Timor in English. Uh, okay. This is Ethiopia. And that little map there, that's pointing to North Korea, not South Korea, not the Korean Peninsula, just North Korea. And finally, that country there is Sri Lanka. Is that finally? No, I think there's one more. Yeah, indeed. And that country is Nepal. So the pub quiz question is, what do all of these countries have in common? Well, I'm sure some people are screaming at the TV, particularly anybody that's uh, seen this talk before or might have read the talk synopsis in one or two places. So the answer is, of course, but those are the countries, those are the eight countries in the world uh, whose official name contains the word democratic. So the next question is, who thinks that those countries are, hands up if you think that those countries are democratic. So I hope we probably realize that they may not be, but let's just uh, find some evidence. So here they are. There's those eight countries with their full names. And as you can see, they've all got the word democratic in them. Uh, some of them, well, notably North Korea, uh, also has the word people in it. So not only are they democratic, but they're owned by the people. Um, so, yeah. So let's see if they are democratic. Well, there's something called the Democracy Index, um, where there's a link to it. That's not a link, but it's uh, referenced at the bottom of the slide there, uh, which ranks all the countries in the world about how democratic they are. So this gives us a, uh, a guide. Obviously, it's slightly open to interpretation. But let's see where these countries rank. Um, not very well. So it seems that uh, the best of them is, is Timor-Leste. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, the, the movements there are from the last time I gave this presentation, which was earlier this year, um, before the Democratic Index had been updated for 2019. So you can see that East Timor has gone up a bit. It's improved from 42 to 41. Um, Nepal and Sri Lanka have both improved a couple of places. So um, you know, I've been doing this talk now for, or 
versions of this talk for a couple of years and uh, it looks like one two three four well five of the countries have moved up so obviously me mocking the words dem democratic in the title of these countries has had some effect and normally when i do this talk depending on what country i am in the world i'll uh, i'll look up the country where i am and see how democratic that country is and um, sometimes it's uh, it's a bit scary, but um, I always have as well in the same list when I compare the country, I always put what number one is. So I guess uh, on this call, does anybody want to hazard a guess about the most democratic country in the world, according to the Democracy Index? Well, it's Norway. It's the according to the Democracy Index, and it has been whenever I've, as soon as I started monitoring it two or three years ago, it's been ranked number one, the most democratic country. Uh, for reference purposes, I'm from the UK. Uh, the United Kingdom is ranked number 14. It's a full democracy, apparently. Uh, we score quite lowly on one thing. It's, there's about five scores in there. I can't remember what it is. Um, it's probably to do with Boris Johnson. But anyway, um, that's where we rank. And for reference sake, does anybody want to guess where the USA is? Oh, I heard someone say 24, 25. That's a good guess. USA number 25, flawed democracy. Nothing to do with Donald Trump, obviously. Um, so just um, because obviously I can't mock Norway like passive aggressively or anything in this. So I just thought I'd share with you some of the other countries where I've done this talk and the difficulty that could come up. So uh, first of all, Belgium. I was very surprised at this. The seat of the, the European uh, government and everything else is, is only rated number 33. It's a flawed democracy. That was quite embarrassing when I looked that up. Uh, not as embarrassing as Ukraine. When I went to the Ukraine, I've been there a couple of times to find that they're, you know, they're barely above authoritarian. Um, and then uh, the worst place that I've been to in terms of, of this talk is Belarus, where I just didn't mention it. I didn't even go there um, because I just thought, oh, my God, you know, it's authoritarian. Is someone going to march me off the stage if I even show this data? So I think I just kept it quiet. So why, why am I mentioning this? Um, I think there's, there's a lesson to be told here. When people um, have to crow about something, when they, want, when they feel the need to boast about something, um, I, that often tells a story. And in my travels, I've often come across people that tell me things like this. And I've, I've actually, this is almost a direct quote from uh, a time when I worked for ThoughtWorks about two years ago where uh, we were starting a new engagement and I had a meeting with the CTO um, and sat down uh, in his office and he told me exactly this. We've been doing Agile for two years and, and we're not seeing any good results. So straight away to me, that's that's a red flag. And it's the same if you if you ever see a job posting when it says uh, we are practicing Agile. It's like, well, why why do you feel the need to boast about it? Do you not think I'm going to come and ask? Do you not think people... Do you not think that developer there, when she comes and applies for a job, do you not think she can just look around and, and see? So I've always found that that's a bit of a red flag um, that you think, feel the need to point it out. And also, uh, in many ways, it shows that you misunderstand what's going on. So, Agile is a dirty word. Now, Agile has become toxified. Why has it become toxified? Well, we'll, we'll get into that. But before I do, uh, there are some other dirty words. And I've noticed that um, a lot of these words that come up, um, Scrum is so dirty, it's in that list twice, I've just noticed. That's amazing. I've been doing these slides for so long, and I've only just noticed it's got the word Scrum in it twice. Um, anyway, the, these can be dirty words uh, in certain environments. MVP, I've seen being a dirty word in lots of places. So there are other dirty words that you need to be aware of. They are contextual. Some companies find them dirty, some don't. Um, so why does this happen? Well, one of the biggest things I've seen uh, around in my travels is something called cargo culting. Um, this is, uh, it comes from something when you read the story, um, after the, during the Second World War, the Americans landed in various Pacific islands and uh, as they advanced um, through the Pacific, and when they landed, they built uh, airstrips. And of course, those airstrips, uh, big aeroplanes would land, discord cargo. And in so doing, a side effect of that was that it brought wealth to the area, it brought supplies, and some of the locals benefited from that. And then, of course, at the end of the war, um, they went away. They stopped landing their airplanes. And the locals who didn't have an understanding of, of technology in certain places, um, what they then did was they started going through the rituals that uh, that the Americans had gone through. They started guiding in doing these things with the big paddles to to try and get the the airplanes to land. 
um, because they felt that if they copied the things that they'd seen the American soldiers and airmen do, that they would attract those big airplanes to land. And that's what's called a cargo cult. And I think one of the big vectors for finding agile to be a dirty word is exactly this. Um, and there are many consultants um, that still go around saying that they can sell agile, but actually all they do is tell people about procedures to go through and they don't go through what underpins agile, which I'll come to. And that's a classic cargo cult. And what I've found in many of the places where I've gone to where agile is a dirty word is one of the major reasons for it is that there is a cargo cult in play. People slavishly follow the rituals and the prescriptions as they see it of, of usually of Scrum. Uh, that's not the fault of Scrum, but usually because of, usually because Scrum is the one that's most accessible. People think if they do the Scrum rituals, they are agile. And that's a classic cargo cult. Um, on Scrum, uh, and this is another danger, um, they're not synonymous. But as you can see, when I Googled for Scrum and Agile together, I, I turned up 33.8 million results. This search was done um, quite a while ago now, maybe a year, year and a half ago. So that might have changed. Um, but one needs to understand that, uh, particularly in the context of, of Agile being a dirty word, Scrum and Agile are not the same thing. And often you find that uh, in many organizations, they have become conflated and people think they are the same thing. We're doing the scrum rituals, so we must be agile. That's very, very dangerous. And fake agile is everywhere. This is an article uh, from the ThoughtWorks website, which was published, uh, I'm not quite sure when, but it's, it's examining how fake agile has risen. And, and I've seen this myself in many places, many of the clients I've worked for and, and before that. Um, and this is what cargo culting is. There are all sorts of different cults of fake agile out there where people think that if they go through some rituals, they do certain things, they follow certain procedures, they are being agile. You see this mostly, I think, in large organizations such as, and large older organizations like banks um, or utility companies or, or government agencies. I've, I've seen a lot of this fake agile. So that's a little bit of the background. So what does dirty look like? If, if your organization thinks that agile is a dirty word, what does it look like? What are the telltale signs that you can look out for? So here's some of those things to look out for. Well, I think a cycle of fear is something that I've seen in many, many different places. Now, this can happen like this. Somebody releases some code. Uh, it doesn't work for whatever reason. Perhaps it causes a production incident. It does various things. So it's a bad release. So. The reaction to that is somebody says, well, that release didn't work. We obviously didn't test it enough. So they say, right, we need more process around tests. We need more testing. Maybe we even need another test team. Um, and somebody else probably says, hey, we need to document this testing better. Well, I don't quite understand how the documentation is going to make the testing better. Um, it'll, it'll act as a good way to prove it was done, maybe. Um, but it doesn't guarantee the quality for sure. Anyway, what does more testing mean? It means that the cycle gets longer. So straight away, we're moving away from a lot of those agile principles, which we haven't even spoken about yet in this talk. Excuse me. So what do longer cycles mean? Well, one of the biggest side effects of having a longer cycle is that you release more stuff. When you release more stuff, that means that more things can go wrong. And not only that, it means the traceability of what's happening in your application is absolutely going to tank. So when you release more things, what's the consequence of that? Well, you get another bad release. This type of big bang cycle of fear I've seen in all sorts of organizations, because while this is going on, they still think that they're being agile. Everybody in the organization says, well, we're doing Scrum, but actually their version of Scrum probably means that they do a two week development cycle, then they do a code freeze, then they do two weeks of testing. The, the cycles probably overlap like this, but effectively there's a four week lead time at least on any code from the time that the code is written to the time it goes into production. And that cycle is going on and that's their main dysfunction. But everybody in the organization is saying agile doesn't work. But it's not agile that doesn't work, but it is agile that has become a dirty word. The ultimate end game of the type of thing that I was just talking about is something called risk management theater. 
Uh, I was never quite sure if this was something that was a, a ThoughtWorks phrase or, or a phrase invented by some of my colleagues. And, and when I Googled it, it doesn't turn up many hits. Um, although if you Google it, you might find some uh, now. But this is essentially the state that a lot of larger organizations get into where everything is driven by process rather than, than outcomes. People are slavishly following processes. Those processes may have become, they may have been a good idea when they were originally set up. Maybe it was a good idea to have a change board in 1998. Maybe it was a good idea to have a separate test team uh, when we were doing waterfall and we didn't know any other way. But what these processes uh, often end up as is, is a set of checklists of things that must be done. And people become slaves to the checklist. They forget or they don't even understand what the original outcome was that this checklist or this, this procedure was supposed to support. And you may find even, and I've seen this in various organizations, that there are whole teams of people whose day-to-day -day work has become servicing checklists to make sure that they don't get blamed when things go wrong. And in fact, there can be vast teams of people that are no longer adding any value. But because they've got a manager and they may even have uh, a director that is responsible for those teams and they've therefore become an empire and a thing in and of themselves, they're very difficult to get rid of. And I remember uh, five years ago now when I was doing some work for a UK, a large UK financial organization, I was working in a building that had 4000 employees or thereabouts working in it. And I spoke to their CTO and I said, to my estimation, from what I've seen in this building, about 40% of the staff fall under this um, type of uh, thing, fall under the, the auspices of, of a team that adds no value. They're just doing box ticking. And I thought that would be a controversial viewpoint. The CTO said, yeah, you're right. And I was absolutely stunned. And I said, what? So, so you agree with me that 1,500 or so people in this building are adding no value? And he was like, yeah. And I said, why don't you do something about it? And he says, I can't because they are, um, they're protected by the, by the organizational immune system. If I try and do anything about that, somebody moans about their budget, somebody else screams, the union scream. And so it's very, very hard to get away from, from this. Here's an example of uh, risk management theater in action. Uh, this is a photograph taken um, by myself uh, when I was walking with my daughter about, uh, about a year ago now. In fact, not far from where I'm living now. And as you can see, uh, there's obviously a great hazard to life there with some broken glass. So clearly there is a procedure um, to secure the area when there's broken glass. Uh, but you may ask, where is the broken glass? Well, I'll, I'll give you a bit of help there. It's, it's in there. It's on that flower bed. Maybe you still can't see it. Uh, if, if we were live, I would see that there'd be some blank looks in the audience, so we can zoom in. There it is. As you can see, there is obviously some very, very dangerous broken glass. Now, you can see that someone's gone to a great deal of trouble to secure this area. There's one, two, three, four pieces of that orange fencing stuff. They're actually, what you can't see, they're sort of, ve they're very securely secured to those iron railings in the background there. Um, and clearly, nobody can get close to that broken glass. So there must be a procedure in place. There must be a checklist that says, if there's any broken glass on, in the area, secure the area, make sure no one could tread on it. And they've gone to enormous trouble and expense. These fences stayed like this for three weeks, at least three weeks, because I made the same walk with my daughter for the following three weeks. So between three and four weeks, these fences stayed like this. How long would it have taken for the person to exercise their common sense, look at that tiny piece of broken glass, and the fact that it looks like safety glass, it looks like a broken pub glass to me, so it won't cut anybody anyway, and just sweep it up. It would have taken seconds, but the process is ruling. This is classic risk management theatre. So what about some other uh, types of procedure? Safe is something that uh, you may have heard of. Uh, again, at this point, if I was with an audience, I'd ask people for a show of hands, is anybody working with safe? I'm not working with SAFE, but I have uh, had the misfortune of working with SAFE. Uh, it's got nine principles, uh, which actually I quite like, uh, apart from uh, one of them, which is that one. And the reason why I don't like that one is because it talks about synchronizing and cross-domain planning, which I think one of the principles that we'll come to later is that you just shouldn't do that. And SAFE, I think, fails on that front because it straight away uh, starts to say that it wants to have uh, this whole coordination across the enterprise. It also has this um, 
agile partner gold thing, accreditation thing, to me, that's a massive red flag. Uh, and this picture in the top right here, that scares me incredibly. And uh, if I zoom in on this picture, you'll see how complex that is. What is going on? I find this diagram hard to interpret. It's got one or two good things in it, uh, which I won't bore you with. It's got some weird stuff in it as well. Um, one thing I don't understand is why the customer is right up there near the top right, uh, when it should be down near the dev team, or at least there should be representations of the customer down there. What I really hate about it is this whole notion of PIs that stands for program increments. The idea is that every few iterations in this picture, I think it looks like there are about five scrum sprints. Um, and then, uh, every five scrum sprints, you have a massive meeting where people get together and, and plan together and work out how they're going to deal with the fact that they're all tightly coupled rather than trying to decouple. Uh, I also dislike the fact that it has DevOps as a team, uh, which is well away from the real teams. So for me, it fundamentally misunderstands agile. Uh, when I worked with, uh, safe, which was all three years or so ago now, I think it was the first half of 2017. Um, every five or six weeks, there was a PI meeting, a program increment meeting. It involved all the staff, uh, in the London office and all the staff in the New York office. Well, not all of them, but a lot of tech people. Uh, it had 80 people in the meeting and it, uh, it lasted for five days. It lasted all evening in the UK. So probably the afternoon in New York time, it lasted for four or five hours. And it was, must've been so costly. They bought everybody dinner. It took all this time. People would have the mornings off and so on and so on and so on. My response to their CTO was, okay, so instead of doing all of this heavyweight planning and stuff, and it still goes wrong, all of your releases still fail on some level because of this coupling. Why don't you invest that money instead in decoupling all your teams from each other? Then you might actually start to be agile. So what do I think of SAFE? Um, my, my honest opinion is that it's actually a command and control thing, um, but it's pretending to be agile. It, it's making agile palatable to uh, the top level leadership of organizations who want to feel like they're in control. They don't want to give autonomy to teams for whatever reason. They're scared of giving up control. And I think SAFE is a sort of compromise for those types of views. Um, Here's another thing that I see from our uh, CTOs. Uh, the cat, by the way, is representing the dysfunctional CTO. Um, it, it, not all CTOs are like this and not all cats are like this. Not all cats are selfish. So, uh, oh yeah, they are. Um, anyway, this, this cat is saying, uh, we must be a special case. How many times have we heard this? We must be a special case. Well, what do we think about this? Well, you know what? I've seen these same problems in lots of different places. Uh, you're not a special case, but it's weird that everybody wants to think they are. The number of times that I've seen people say, we're a special case, agile doesn't work for us. So for those people, agile is a dirty word. So I think uh, some of the, the telltale signs to look out for. If you look at the agile manifesto, which I'm going to come on to soon, good agile can promise those things. Small, safe to fail bets. Uh, experiments might be a better word than bets there. Um, earlier, more frequent learning opportunities is all about those feedback loops, more honesty, more accuracy around planning. Uh, I'm not sure. I like the word honesty there. I'm not sure about accuracy. Well, we can plan accurately for a couple of weeks, but it, is it really valuable to plan beyond that? I don't know. Uh, it certainly should lead to empowerment of teams and individuals and uh, frequent opportunities to, to change and mold the process you're going through to own that process. But actually what I've often seen it deliver is that. And um, you can draw your own conclusions, um, but uh, I've certainly been involved in, in all of those or, or I've seen uh, these dysfunctions around. Uh, you can play bingo with this deck, I think. You know, um, you know every time you see something that, that you've been involved in, tick a little box, and then maybe at the end you can come back to me and, and say how many of these things you've seen, either in the organization you're working in now or the organizations that you've worked in, in the past. I particularly like that frequent opportunities to mold the process. That's about um, uh, doing retros where everybody owns their process and moves on. How many times have you seen a retro descend into everybody moaning at everybody else? Yeah. Okay. 
This to me is one of the biggest dysfunctions, not only uh, well in business in general and in life in general. Um, people want to plan budgets. Now, when we talk about agile having short feedback loops and reacting to what's going on, why do you therefore impose upon me uh, the requirement for me to tell you how much money I need this year? Well, I don't know. Uh, is is my honest answer to that. Uh, I think what we ought to do is 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 start saying, well, give me enough money to run my team and we will always do the right thing. Empower me and trust me to do the right thing. But of course, large organizations, particularly, uh, again, uh, unwieldy things like banks, uh, utility companies, and particularly government, they're obsessed with budgeting in advance. Uh, I know there are reasons for that, but um, we need to find a better way. Unfortunately, I don't necessarily have all the answers. Um, I have noticed a few stats around uh, UK CEOs, for example. Um, they don't last very long, so um, I don't see. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that fits in, but they're obsessed by annual budgets somehow. Um, it's difficult to see how I can be agile and 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 ma make my process map to annual funding when really that doesn't isn't appropriate. And one of the worst side effects of this type of thinking is that technology decisions are cost based rather than value based because people find it hard to understand value. They're in a mindset of only assessing cost. Um, I'm, I still don't know what the best answers are for budgeting. So I'm, I'm really open to, to ideas on, on how we can do better in budgeting, because I think these dysfunctional funding models are, are, are some of the biggest dysfunctions uh, in the world. And by the way, it's worth pointing out in, in our real life, we, we, get, we don't get paid annually. We get paid either monthly or weekly. Um, so we're all used to budgeting on a, on a much more short-term basis. We can all pivot our, budget, our budgets, our personal budgets, and we frequently do. Uh, at Christmas in the UK, we spend a lot more money than, than we do at other times of the year. And I'm sure there are other times seasonal spending patterns. Uh, we deal with it. Um, so I don't know why businesses are obsessed with, with annual budgeting um i think this is the final slide in this section um recently i think i found this uh, maybe six months ago i was really pleased to see that the u.s government uh in particular the department of defense has uh, actually it's a bit older than i thought um has published some papers on agile bs as they call it um so that's a really interesting paper. I ought to go and have a look at it um, because really this is saying a lot of the same things that um, people like me are saying about badly applied agile, which, which I find really refreshing that uh, a government agency has, has managed to uh, start realizing this. Okay, the blame culture. Uh, I think I touched upon this already. If you see a blame culture around you, the chances are this is um, uh, a big problem in your organization. Postmortems, hero cultures, they're all part of the same thing. Uh, that's a sure sign that things are going badly and, and this can impinge on your ability to, to do agile well. So how do we get past uh, agile being a dirty word? So uh, I've got a couple of tips on how to start moving forward. In one of my other talks, I'll go into a bit more detail on, on one of the case studies that I'll briefly show you. Um, so here's, here's some tips, and I'm happy to take questions on this later. One thing I found really valuable is to avoid dirty words. I went into at least three different organizations in the last couple of years and never would use the word agile. So in order to understand what we should and shouldn't say, uh, I think it's important to understand what agile is. In order to understand what it is, it's probably equally as important to understand what it isn't. I've already said Agile and Scrum are not synonymous. Um, that's not to say that some Scrum implementations aren't Agile, because they are. Uh, same applies to Kanban. Um, but most importantly, I think you need to understand, we all need to understand that Agile is not a process. It definitely isn't something you can buy off a shelf. What it is, is a manifesto of four values and 12 principles. And I really hope that everybody in this talk has, has seen the, the Agile values. Uh, there they are. Um, and I like the way that this is presented. It's saying we value this over this. And then there's a footnote in there that says, um, we still value the stuff on the right, but we value the stuff on the left more. So we're not saying that comprehensive documentation is not valuable, but we're saying that working software is more important. And then 
This is my point about uh, avoiding the dirty words. Go into the um, Agile Manifesto, go into whatever your, your literature is and pull out things that are important from that and which will help the organization you're working with. Now, on the little picture on the right there is a presentation that I first gave uh, a couple of years ago when I moved to a new organization. I could see that they didn't understand Agile. But I didn't want to start talking about Agile 101, which was the original suggestion given to me, because that would have been insulting for the people I was working with. So I've got a presentation there called TPS Value Streams and the Theory of Constraints. And that presentation was all about teaching people the Agile values and the Agile principles. But I never once mentioned the word Agile in that presentation. And equally, I avoid lots of other dirty words that I may have seen in that organization. So maybe MVP is a dirty word, so I don't mention it. And here is a talk of an MVP. People often say, we don't want an MVP, we want a fully working product. And they, they miss the point of an MVP. An MVP is something to, that returns value quickly that lets us understand our hypotheses. So this is the example that I always give of an MVP. This is an ex-colleague of mine from ThoughtWorks. And we wanted to give this picture into a newsletter, which was uh, the green glow of the computer screen that you used to see in films where people were doing hacking like this really quickly. So we wanted to make this photo. So obviously, uh, you can see that the technical technical effects we went to there were really, really complex until you realized that this was a proper MVP. That's how we did it. We used a green bottle. We used uh, the torch on, on somebody else's mobile phone. And then I just cropped the picture. That's an MVP. That told us that the picture was valuable. That enabled me to go to the other people in our group and say, does this look right? And then we published it. That's what an MVP is all about. So by detaching um, things uh, into little examples like this and avoiding those dirty words directly, we can start to make headway um, in the organization that we're in. Value stream mapping is, is a good thing to go through because value and waste are not generally dirty words. So I like to put this slide up and, and illustrate to people that if your value stream, this is a much simplified version of a value stream map, uh, everything on the top line adds value, everything on the bottom line is waste, and there are context switches in between that are also very costly. Uh, as time goes forward, you can see that some things add value, like doing dev work, doing some QA, um, releasing, uh, things like uh, sitting in a queue, uh, people asking questions, code reviews, uh, waiting to get released, none of those things add value. And the key point here to put across to whoever you're talking to is that you haven't returned value to the business until the very end, until you've got working software in production. So you, you can look at this and you can start to apply agile principles and values to removing that waste. Here's a quick example, another example about waste in particular. This is after England's got knocked out of the World Cup in 2018. I was at a conference and uh, I helped to tidy up the mess afterwards. Can anybody spot the waste in that picture? Well, um, of course, it's not in the bin because those are empty beer bottles. They delivered the value they're expected to. They helped us to get drunk. The waste is the puddle of beer on the floor there because that's where I spilt one when, as I opened it, somebody jogged me and I spilt half of it. So the beer on the floor is the waste. So waste is not always obvious, but it's a good conversation that we can have in organizations. Uh, that's an easy message to land. And you'll find that if you talk about waste, uh, you can steer the conversation around to opportunities that you're missing or delaying. And you start to trust teams to deliver on, on agreed outcomes. And it's a great way to start people questioning their process to start getting them to own the process. So notice we still aren't, we're still not talking about agile, but we're steering the conversation around to valuable things. I often hear people ask about examples uh, because they've only ever seen dysfunctional agile. Well. A good way here is to look in the press. And here's an example I found. Uh, again, this is getting quite old now. It's nearly a couple of years old. It was in the sports pages of the Times. And it was an article about Jose Mourinho, um, who's now manager of Spurs. He was manager of Chelsea, uh, Manchester United at the time. But the article was talking about young coaches. Um, here's the, some of the text. The bit to zoom in on it is this. Uh, this chap called Tedesco, who was Schalke manager at the time, it talks about him having a revolutionary way of inviting the team to determine tactics and prepare for games, how he stimulated them to review their own performances. Apparently, he's got a God-given talent for motivating and explaining. 
And Tedesco says a team believes more strongly in a plan if they feel they had a hand conceiving it. So to me, that's common sense. That's agile thinking. So examples like this are great. And if you want to look through the press, you'll find them everywhere. You'll find it's normally talked of as revolutionary thinking in whatever field it is. But actually, it's following agile principles. Here's another way that we can talk about agile principles. Um, this is something that talks about tech at core. Again, not directly mentioning agile, not even indirectly mentioning agile, but it's talking about how bringing your business, your tech and your business parts together can help achieve good outcomes. And you'll find that in order to bring them together, you have to, uh, following the agile principles and the agile manifesto is a great way of doing that. Uh, here's a slide, uh, it's slightly modified that I actually gave to one of our big clients where I split that previous picture up into some sliders. And again, these can be applied directly to some of the Agile principles, or you can make your own up, which are in line with the Agile principles. And as you can see there, um, the top two are my favorite ones. Are you driven by processes or outcomes? Do you think technology is a cost center, or do you think it creates value for your business? So none of this talks to Agile, but Agile principles will feed into this. Um, and again, there's, there's other ways that we can, we can talk to this. We can put our own sliders on stick within those uh, what what is consistent with agile principles and it works really well and here's a great way this book um, accelerate doesn't ever mention the word agile but nobody can argue with with the four key metrics the 24 key capabilities and you'll find that um, agile principles agile practice agile um, uh, values is a great way of helping you achieve all of these things and improving on those things so Finally, cleaning up the mess. So I'm going to talk a bit about how um, directly I've, I've been involved in, in places where we've, we've helped to clean it up. So here's, here's the first thing and another, my last anecdote that I'll share with you. Um, this is Leicester Forest Services in the UK. Um, it's on a motorway, the M1 that goes down from Leeds to London. Uh, I was looking forward to eating up there one day because I know there's a KFC um this is before i went vegetarian by the way i wouldn't do this now um here's the burger king next door to the kfc now it's always annoyed me that this burger king which is right next door to it advertises chicken products because if you're going to buy chicken products you're going to go to kfc you're not going to go to burger king so that advert always annoyed me because there's a kfc next door to it so i was looking forward to having some kfc i get there and as you can see in this picture um the kfc was closed it was closed for refurbishment so i was like oh that's disappointing well never mind i'll go to burger king and i'll have a burger so what do i do i join the queue uh, but wait you might notice there is a little printed notice to the left of where it says collection point if i zoom in on that unfortunately it doesn't zoom up very well uh unfortunately we're experiencing problems we can't serve any beef products so i was like oh god i can't get my double whopper burger but you know what? You can have chicken or vegetarian products. <laughs> so we apologize for inconvenience. So what happened? Well, um, Burger King bean burgers, I, I haven't actually tried them in recent years since I went vegetarian, but I certainly wasn't going to have one at the time because they were awful. So I was forced to have a substandard chicken product. What happened? Well, that chicken product was way better than anything I've ever bought from KFC. It absolutely blew my mind and it changed my outlook on chicken products forever. So this is demonstrating agility. And this is another way I've used anecdotes in real life and going to, to the companies I've worked for and said, you must be agile with a small a. Has anybody, un, anybody seen this quote before? Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Your strategy needs to be agile. Your business needs to be agile. This is why you should embrace agile as a concept. So this, this quote is from, of course, Mike Tyson, the boxer. And it perfectly encapsulates the way that modern businesses should operate. You need to be agile enough to react to what's going in the, in, on in the business so we can help you to be agile. So it's a great way to start these conversations. Here's a great quote, again, from Peter Senge. The Fifth Discipline is a great book, introduces uh, systems thinking. The only sustainable competitive advantage is your ability to learn faster than your competition. Everybody should embrace that. Everybody should be embracing Agile with a small A. This is usually lesson one at the exec level of organizations I've worked for. So once, once we're past those initial things, home in on the goal. This is a great way to steer the conversation to Agile. Everybody should read the goal. Uh, if you haven't, I really strongly advise you do. 
uh, it introduces the theory of constraints. This is a great agile principle. Um, if you always understand what your goal is, you work towards it, the goal tells us that there will always be one major constraint. Concentrate on that major constraint, fix that major constraint, lessen it, lessen its impact until that is no longer your biggest constraint, then move on to the next constraint. And that slide has got a typo on it, which is very disappointing. Um, so that's a great way to start getting everybody thinking in an agile way. So concentrate on one problem at a time. And this leads me into this question. Whenever I've seen agile transformation so-called fail, it's often because a consultant comes in and says, right, I'm going to change your whole process in one go. But why would you do that? This gets back to our, our big bang thing from before. If you change 20 things about the process all at once, well, firstly, it's likely to fail because people get change fatigue and so on and so on. Um, and they don't know what they're doing. But secondly, how on earth do you know what worked and what didn't? If I change everything I do, what was good, what was bad, I can't possibly know. So my biggest piece of advice when I go in and start in a dysfunctional or, or a less than optimal environment is to say, okay, let's just look at one thing at a time. Let's change, let's talk about what the biggest problem is and change it one thing at a time. This is where I had, we had in ThoughtWorks the most success in, in re-engineering re companies and processes is by looking at the biggest problem one at a time and fixing that and then moving on to the next, moving on to the next, moving on to the next. This is a great way to start people getting away from agile is a dirty word. And the important thing to notice about this slide is if you go in, dump a massive process change on everybody and say, right, now you're agile, six months later when it's not working, they're not going to blame you for putting that there. They're just going to blame agile. Agile is to blame. Agile doesn't work. So the biggest message that I've put forward, and you might have got this, is focus on outcomes, not the process. If you let the process drive what you do, you're letting the tail wag the dog. Let everybody own their process and let them just drive towards an outcome. Sure, tell them what outcomes is valuable, but discuss with them why the outcome is valuable to them. Discuss with them what that outcome is and trust them to deliver it. Next, get buy-in from everybody. Workshops are great. Getting the team to own their own process, getting them to feel they own what's going on will get their buy-in. If you have their buy-in, then they will buy into what's going on. They will believe in it. They will help to deliver it. And workshops are a great way to get to the shared outcomes. And uh, everybody loves a good metaphor. Uh, I think I've touched upon this. You can see that I like telling stories. I love this picture. I wish I'd drawn it myself. I didn't do, um, but you know, that tells everything. And I love using this as a way of describing tech debt. And talking of tech debt, here's a workshop that uh, we designed uh, to, to articulate tech debt to people that don't understand it. This, I can't remember which way around it is, and I can't see in the picture, but either the blues or the pink stickies are talking about things that make you take on tech debt, such as pressure from a stakeholder or a bad release, or things that make you do tech debt. And the other color is things that are tech debt, like a missing test or a piece of refactoring you didn't do. And then the arrows are showing that the one causes the other. And when we ran this exercise, we found all these feedback loops and it was brilliant because the product owners that were trying to get the tech teams not to improve the overall picture suddenly started to understand why their own behavior was causing the releases to take longer and longer. And it was a wonderful moment. So that tech debt workshop helped get buy-in from everybody concerned around making sure that we don't take on more tech debt. And the final thing, here's a quick story. Um, I worked with a team over a period of four months and we, we talked about their process and I think that's what the green stickies are here. Um, but we didn't talk about yet what it was delivering. And I wanted them to talk me through everything that they did and uh, to get some software live. The green stickies describe that, the pink stickies are sort of notes and the blue stickies were the outcomes being driven by what was going on above. And it was amazing how many of the different things they did were to do with sharing context. One thing we just said was, well, why don't you pair? Then you won't have to have all of these set piece rituals to share context. Uh, that's the second, that's the right hand side of that same picture. It's essentially a sort of path to production thing. It took us three weeks to build that picture because I, as I said earlier, I didn't want to change things uh, in a big bang style. And eventually uh, we talked about the rituals that they did and which ones were important. And then we much streamlined their process. But importantly, we did it one thing at a time over a period of four or five weeks. And then at the end of that period, everything was working so much better. 
And a lot of people came to me and said, how did you do this? Tell us what process you put in place and everything. And it was just simply this. It was change one thing at a time, get people to own the process, get them to buy into the changes that we make. And this is the team that I was working with. Uh, one of the people in that picture uh, is, is my colleague. The others are clients, uh, client developers. This was a, a model that, that works really well where you mix the client developers with the, the consultants and then you gradually hand over ownership. Um, this is uh, the guy in the purple hoodie is the client tech lead. He's now owning the stand up and you can see that our board is is much better looking than it. I should have had a picture of the board before this started, actually, because it was a right mess. Um, but you can see there's lots of stuff in the done column. There's very little work in progress, uh, which is the two columns immediately to the left under the orange cards. And then here's the end game. This is that same chap that was in the purple hoodie uh, doing running his first workshop. And this was actually a tech deck workshop similar to the one that I showed you on an earlier slide, which was an earlier engagement. And this is him looking very nervous with him running his first workshop. And this is him looking really happy with the outcome of that workshop afterwards. And once we'd gone through that, and I was with that team for another couple of weeks after that, I moved on to a different team because our work was done there. They now had full ownership. They were confident to, to take things forward uh, as best they could. And importantly, they were all buying into what they were doing. And without really going overboard on Agile, we were now an Agile team. And it was a great success. So to finish, what does it look like when things are clean? Um, you, should, you should have got rid of your silos. Um, any architects you have should be focused on outcomes, not on the technologies. Teams should be cross-functional and you should decouple your technology as much as possible. I don't have enough time to talk about all the techniques around doing that, um, but you should have clearly articulated goals and values and that will help to lead to alignment so get everybody to understand what their goal is and the personal values within the team um, better aligned teams will obviously work better towards aligned goals and outcomes um, hopefully you'll find that a learning culture will replace a blame culture uh, your retros will be better and and people won't be afraid to experiment won't be afraid to to learn from things the language of mistakes and failures will be replaced by learnings so experimental culture, useful learning. Uh, things only fail in an experiment if you get an, uh, an, an inconclusive result. Um, if, if something, if you have a hypothesis, it turns out to be false, you now know one more thing that won't work. That's a useful outcome. Most importantly, I think retros are for learning, not blaming. This is the, the retro prime directive. Uh, I've always liked to show this at the start of a retro to emphasize to people, this is not about blaming, this is about learning and improving. So, when agile is a dirty word, uh, it's important to understand the history. Why did it end up being a dirty word in the place you are? Um, I would recommend to start with, avoid talking about it, avoid those dirty words, but talk about the underlying values and principles. Then you can start cleaning up Agile, you can start cleaning up other things. And then Agile is clean when you trust your teams and they're empowered to deliver value quickly and iteratively while they're owning and improving their own destiny. And then hopefully when that happens, uh, everybody is happy. So in summary, Agile isn't about a process. It is about facilitating useful outcomes. It is about culture and values. It's very definitely about culture and values. And it is very, very much about the people. Agile is not a dirty word when you understand what it means. Thank you very much for listening.